So welcome to the IRIS webinar for this week. Um, this is Andy Forsetto. I'm broadcasting from the uh, headquarters office of the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology in Washington, D.C. And uh, if you've come for the webinar, you're in the right place. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a project associate at IRIS, and I help manage the Global Seismic Network as well as the US Array program for EarthScope. And uh, running the webinar program is one of the uh, perks in my job. So if you have ideas for topics or speakers, uh, I'm the guy to email. So uh, please, we always like to get feedback from the people who are attending these. Um, just so that everybody knows the drill for how these work, uh, this is a lot like a university uh, department colloquium. So uh, the way that we work it here is that uh, our speaker will give a 45 minute talk. And uh, during that time, uh, everyone will be muted except the speaker. And if you have a question, what you can do is, uh, and what I would ask is if you could clearly and concisely type it, into the question box on the webinar control panel. And uh, what we'll do at the end of the webinar is I will go through all those questions and uh, ask them for you to the speaker. So typically what I do is I'll read the name and the question and the speaker will have a chance to reply to each person's uh, question or comment. During the whole process, uh, we record it. So the presentation and the questions will be recorded, archived, and put up on YouTube. And then uh, those webinars are accessible uh, through a gateway page that we put together that has a little thumbnail uh, with information about each uh, previous webinar. So uh, if you've missed any in the past and you're curious about them, you can find them here. Otherwise, uh, you can also find them through the Iris ENO YouTube channel. Uh, we've had one hiccup with the webinar, and I think over a dozen at this point, where uh, due to a technical error, the webinar crashed. So uh, what I would ask if that happens is we can recover it and continue from where we started. Uh, you just need to try to get into the webinar again, because I'll be able to set it back up from our end. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker uh, today, who is Dr. Diana Roman. Uh, she is a staff scientist uh, just down the road, actually, at the Carnegie Institute of Washington at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. And uh, Diana has her master's and PhD from the University of Oregon, where she studied uh, physical volcanology and then transitioned over to volcano seismicity, which is the topic of her webinar today, which is titled The Secret Lives of Quiescent Volcanoes, Clues from Volcano Seismology. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Diana, and change the presentation mode. There you go. All right. Okay, so hopefully everybody should uh, be able to see my screen now. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, first off, um, I wanted to thank Andy for setting up uh, this, this webinar and for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's a little bit intimidating that this is going to be immortalized on, on YouTube for all eternity, but um, at the same time, I think that's a fantastic resource, and I've gone back and watched some of those talks, um, and uh, I encourage you all to, to do so as well. Um, so I, I know that this talk was advertised fairly broadly, so I'm, I'm going to try to err on the side of keeping things uh, pretty simple. Um, I'm not assuming that I'm talking to uh, volcanologists or seismologists or volcano seismologists. Um, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but I'm of course more than happy to um, uh, elaborate on anything or clarify anything at the end of the talk. Um, finally, I just want to acknowledge my, my two co-authors here, uh, Mel Rogers and John O'Brien, uh, who are PhD students uh, working with me at the University of South Florida. Um, and I'm going to be showing uh, in part of the talk some, of, some results from a couple of studies that the two of them have, have led. So I just wanted to acknowledge them uh, up front. Okay, uh, so the way that the talk is going to go, it's, it's sort of a two-parter. Um, so during the first half, I'm, I'm just going to go over a few uh, sort of basic principles or quirks of volcano seismology, um, how, it, how it differs from uh, normal seismology and, and some of the, the, the basic models we have for understanding the seismicity of volcanoes. 
Um, I'll also talk a little bit about um, the challenges of doing research in volcano seismology on a, a very broad scale and also how that leads to um, some, some big unanswered questions in the field and, and grad students out there who are uh, looking for interesting uh, projects. I, I, I hope that uh, this um, gets your attention because it's a, it's a very new field and, and there's certainly a lot of uh, big questions left to answer. Um, the second half of the talk, I'll, I'll get into some specifics of some of the research that I and my group have done uh, focusing on uh, seismic signatures of um, various uh, phases of the volcanic cycle, um, mostly focusing on uh, the seismicity we see when volcanoes aren't uh, technically in eruption. So I'll show you um, a few case studies from uh, seismicity before, during, and after, uh, with the during representing actually a pause and an interruption. And then the last thing I want to go over is, uh, is a sort of uh, understudied but uh, really interesting example of a volcano that's, um, from a seismology perspective, uh, doing some very interesting things but, but technically not in eruption. Um, and then I'll just try and sum it all up, uh, give you a few final thoughts, and then we can move on to the questions. Okay. Um, so the, the very first principle of, of volcano seismology is that um, we see earthquakes, discrete seismic events, when we put seismometers on a volcano. We also often see uh, continuous signals um, that are generated by processes uh, beneath the volcano. Um, and uh, some of these signals look similar to the types of uh, seismic events that are recorded on faults, um, but we also have some, uh, what we thought for a long time were, were unique signals, um, now they're actually being discovered in um, other settings such as subduction zones, which is kind of exciting. Um, but uh, just very basically, um, I'm going to talk about two different classes of events, um, high frequency earthquakes and uh, low frequency earthquakes, or VTs um, and LPs. Um, VTs are basically just um, very small tectonic earthquakes um, thought to be produced by uh, stresses generated by volcanic processes. Um, they have uh, body waves, P and S. Um, they have uh, dominant energy above uh, 5 hertz and, and fairly broadband energy. Um, and we think of them basically as, as little rock-breaking shear failure events uh, that result from uh, magma breaking its way through and pushing aside rock as it ascends through the crust. So these are, these are fairly straightforward in terms of their source process. Um, on the other end of the scale, we have um, LP events, uh, which, uh, as their name implies, are lower frequency. Um, they typically have uh, energy uh, below uh, 3 hertz, um, sometimes as high as 5 hertz. Um, in contrast to the VTs, they're very monochromatic. Um, you can see that this is a very narrow frequency band here. Um, and these are less well understood. Um, there are lots of different models uh, out there to uh, explain how they're generated. Um, many of them come, come down to um, uh, processes involving fluid flow, either gas or uh, liquid or uh, perhaps magma and some sort of resonance process. So maybe like um, air blowing through a pipe and setting up a resonance in the walls. Um, but there are other mechanisms. And then, of course, we have other, other sorts of things that volcanoes do. Um, down here, just as one other example, I'm showing you a seismic signature of a volcanic explosion. Um, you can see this one is, uh, is fairly monochromatic, mostly in the low frequencies, but its real distinguishing feature is, is how long it goes on for. So if you just compare the different time scales of these events, you'll see that that explosion signature is, is much longer. Um, so often it can be hard to tell these apart, but uh, in general we can usually break things into LP and BT and identify uh, more surficial processes from processes that are occurring uh, beneath the volcano. Okay, the second basic principle I want to introduce uh, is this idea of a, a sort of a generic precursory sequence. Uh, and this was a, a model that was put forward by Steve McNutt um, quite some time ago. Um, I think it, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, sort of basis for discussion and certainly there are precursory sequences that follow this model very nicely. Um, uh, 
but of course, as always with models, there are exceptions, and, and I'm going to focus on a few of those today. Um, but just to summarize uh, this model, so the idea is that uh, as you move through time towards an eruption, there's a characteristic sequence of events, um, both in, in, in terms of the type of seismicity, so the high frequency or the, the VT seismicity and the low frequency seismicity types, um, and also the rate of seismicity that precedes an eruption. And we can loosely relate uh, what we're seeing in terms of seismic rates and event types to processes that are occurring beneath the volcano. And then based on this, we can, we can potentially make some forecasts about um, the, how close we are to eruption. So the general idea is that you go from some background state. It's not necessarily a zero state. Um, many volcanoes do have some, some level of background seismicity that uh, is produced by essentially residual activity, regional stresses, um, fluid circulation in the volcano, um, but at a relatively low rate. And then uh, as, as the volcano moves into an eruptive phase, uh, the rate of seismicity goes up, but the first events are typically VT, rock-breaking earthquakes, uh, that are produced by magma that's, that's pushing its way up through the crust, um, through the mid-crust, uh, towards the surface. Uh, closer to eruption, uh, the model uh, suggests that low frequency events begin to occur as the magma arrives uh, near the surface and begins to degas um, and starts to uh, interact perhaps with um, a hydrothermal system uh, to generate uh, fluid flow processes that manifest as low frequency events. Um, as that process intensifies, those events can then actually merge into a continuous signal known as volcanic tremor. Um, which is, uh, in this model, a very extreme short-term precursor to eruption. And I also note that there is no time scale on this plot. Um, this uh, time can uh, last anywhere from months uh, to, to days. Um, and then, of course, seismicity does continue through the eruption and, and after the eruption as well. So this is sort of the basis that we're working from. Um, and this is sort of the generic, if we know nothing else, uh, what we might expect a volcano to do from a seismic perspective um, before it erupts. Okay, uh, principle three um, for the purposes of this talk um, has to do with uh, definition of activity. Um, and uh, basically volcano seismologists, people who put instruments on volcanoes, I think uh, have, a, have a different perception of, of what an inactive or an active volcano uh, is, which volcanoes are active and which volcanoes are inactive. Um, so for much of human history, um, you could pretty easily say whether your volcano was active or inactive by looking at it and saying whether it was erupting or not, um, basically make, making observations. Um, and there really wasn't much more before um, volcanoes began to um, be instrumented uh, that you could say about what was going on. It was either erupting or not. Um, there are some exceptions to that, of course. There are um, sort of sparse documented accounts of people, um, for example, feeling earthquakes uh, before an eruption. Pliny the Younger talks about uh, several days of uh, tremors, felt tremors before the eruption of Vesuvius. Um, but in general, um, if you're not instrumenting a volcano, um, if you're just on the Earth's surface looking at it, um, it's pretty easy to say what your volcano, what state your volcano is. Um, so I'm going to introduce the, these terms and define them the way that I'm going to be using them in this talk. Um, these definitions may not be necessarily what you're used to, um, but uh, again, they're, they're sort of with the intent of uh, you know, what we can say when we have instruments on a volcano. Um, so some people talk about active volcanoes as those that have erupted in the past uh, millennia or in the Holocene or so on. Um, the, the terms are actually used fairly inconsistently in the literature, so I'm just going to be um, straightforward with you and make sure that you understand at least how I'm using these terms. Um, so when I talk about an active volcano, I'm talking about a volcano that's currently in the process of erupting, so stuff is coming out the top, or at least stuff is visible at the top of the volcano. Um, a quiescent volcano um, is the converse, one that's not currently erupting, but that may erupt in the future, that for, for whatever reason we suspect, um, has the potential to, to move into an eruption. And so that, those are pretty clear states, um, pretty easy to distinguish, um, especially if you're just worried about what you can see on the surface. You can pretty much say 
which category your favorite volcano fits into. Um, a third term that's also a little bit more difficult to define, I'm not going to use it that much in this talk, um, is the term extinct volcano. And again, there are various definitions that have been put out in the literature. Um, but basically, the term extinct implies that over whatever time scale you're really caring about, that volcano does not have a likelihood of erupting at all in the future. So as a subset of quiescent volcanoes, I've listed this term restless volcano, and this is what this talk is concerned about. Um, so when you go and you put instruments on a volcano, or maybe if you're close enough and you start to feel things, then the volcano is somewhere in between its quiescent and active state. You don't know where on that spectrum it is or whether it's going to become active or become quiescent. Um, and that's really the point that I'm trying to get at. So these are the terms as I'm going to use them in this talk. And I'm really going to focus on this category, the subcategory of quiescent volcanism, volcanoes that aren't erupting but that are showing some sort of sign of being, uh, being uh, potentially in the near term in eruption. Okay. So moving on to a few of the, the challenges um, of doing research in volcano seismology. Um, I'm going to go through three, um, and I'm, I'm really going to focus on the third one, and, and certainly these aren't all of them, but um, I, think, I think these are some of the, the big things that characterize the field as it currently stands. Um, one of the biggest problems we face is that uh, we can't go back to an eruption after it happened and collect seismic data um, the way that a physical volcanologist can go back to a deposit. Uh, and do essentially a post-mortem on that eruption and collect information about what was going on during the eruption or perhaps even before the eruption um, because we have to have our instruments out at the time. So um, it's impossible to seismically instrument all of the quiescent potentially erupting volcanoes on Earth, so we have to make some choices. Um, to, to put seismometers on a volcano is very costly. Um, it's also logistically very di difficult, um, not only to, to set up and maintain the instrumentation in the harsh environment, but also to, to get the data back. Um, it's very high rate data, so it's, it becomes a, a volume issue and telemetry becomes uh, costly and, and technologically difficult. So we have to make choices about which volcanoes on Earth are going to get seismometers. Um, and uh, the volcanoes that, that tend to be seismically instrumented and so, so that tend to be uh, available for a person like myself uh, to study um, fall into one of three categories, not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, a volcano that's particularly hazardous, um, potentially because it's near a, a population center um, or because there's uh, some indication that it tends to have very large eruptions. Um, so, for example, Rainier, um, which is uh, very close to the city of Seattle and Tacoma, um, is a particularly hazardous volcano, um, also has the potential for uh, large landsliding events. Um, so this is a volcano that, that we would decide would be important to seismically instrument. Um, a volcano that's had a history of very large catastrophic eruptions, like one of the major caldera systems in the U.S., Yellowstone, uh, Long Valley, Campi Flagre in Italy. These are volcanoes that, that produce massive eruptions. Um, so those are certainly um, important volcanoes because of the scale of the hazard that, that they present. Um, volcanoes that have recently erupted or that have recently uh, shown some sort of sign of unrest that may uh, be building to an eruption. So Mount St. Helens uh, erupted in, uh, in the early 80s and was very well seismically instrumented. Uh, during and after that eruption, uh, which was uh, fortunate because uh, it then erupted again in 2004. Um, but other volcanoes that have had uh, some sort of uh, visible unrest, either you know, visible snow melting on the surface or increased degassing, um, might be uh, volcanoes that would also be instrumented. So for example, the South Sister Volcano in Oregon uh, began to show signs of inflation uh, back in the early 2000s, and so that was certainly a, an impetus for um, putting seismometers on that, on and around that volcano. Um, finally, volcanoes that are in continuous or long-term eruptions. So these are what we tend to refer to in volcanology as the lab volcanoes. Um, and this is, these are great volcanoes because they're always giving us a show. They're always giving us, um, showing us tricks. Um, and giving us the opportunity to take a seismometer, to take an instrument out, 
um, and to pretty much have a, a near guarantee of, of getting some, some data from some actual volcanic activity. So um, these are volcanoes like uh, Kilauea in Hawaii, which has been in near continuous eruption since 1983, uh, Kalima, in Mexico, which is in a very long-term eruption, uh, Santiago, and so on. Um, so those are volcanoes that tend to get instrumented because we we kind of know that we can use them as a lab that they'll give us some data that that means something other than um, you know a volcano is just sitting here doing nothing. Okay, um, and that 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 all makes sense. Again, you know, in trying to partition limited resources, the, these are very logical um, criteria for deciding how to distribute those resources. Um, however, the second research challenge that we have um, in uh, sort of stepping back and interpreting seismic data from volcanoes, particularly when we try to generalize um, from one volcano to volcanoes as a whole or to a class of volcanoes, is have we created a biased understanding because we've looked at a very specific subset of, of volcanoes um, using seismic or other instrumentation. Um, so we generally try to apply what we learn at one volcano to other volcanoes, but in many cases we're, we're missing very large, uh, we don't have representations of certain classes of volcanoes um, in our understanding. So, uh, for example, um, one of the big missing pieces in volcano seismology is an understanding of what seismicity looks like prior to uh, a major a Plinian um, and or rhyolitic eruption, um, particularly um, on a long time scale. Um, so, for example, I've just put up some of my, um, my favorites on this list. So, um, we don't know the answer to um, what volcanoes like Chaiten and Pinatubo, um, Tambora, what they were doing seismically in the decades, years, months, centuries uh, before they were erupting because there were no seismometers um, on those volcanoes. Pinatubo had some uh, shortly before its eruptions, but um, we don't know in the long term whether that eruption, which was quite massive, was preceded by several episodes of um, non-eruptive seismic unrest, whether we could see that there was magma accumulating in large volumes. Um, we just don't have the data. So uh, this is one bias. Um, another, another issue uh, that comes from this, this bias problem is the question of whether extinct volcanoes or re volcanic regions are really extinct. Um, so this becomes an important question, uh, for example, if you're thinking about trying to site, uh, for example, a high-level nuclear waste facility. Um, so Yucca Mountain is a volcano. Um, it hasn't erupted in uh, tens of millennia, but um, we don't know that it hasn't had shallow magma intrusions during that time, which could potentially interact with a facility. Another example is Mauna Kea, which is the site of many large, expensive telescope facilities. Um, it's, it's considered that that's a volcano that's unlikely to erupt, but we, again, don't really know um, whether it, it experiences activity on a longer-term time scale uh, that may not manifest as, as deposits that we can then find on the surface or, or in recorded history. Um, so the problem is that it's it's very difficult because of the time scale that you have to um, you have to consider to answer these questions to get uh, research funding um, for for these sorts of studies. Um, you know, typical NSF funded deployments are on the order of, of three to five years um, or so. Um, while these types of questions take decades worth of data to answer. So we can certainly start to address these questions by looking at long-term data sets that are collected by volcano monitoring agencies through their continuous monitoring programs. Um, there are a few other possible approaches to take uh, to these sorts of questions. For example, um, using uh, INSAR, arc scale INSAR, INSAR studies as, as a guide. Um, so uh, some of this work is being done by Matt Pritchard at Cornell and his colleagues, um, essentially trying to go and target uh, volcanoes that they've seen deformation um, at through INSAR and, and put seismometers on those volcanoes to see what's going on. I think that's absolutely fantastic work. Um, another option would be to start to rethink our instrumentation strategy, um, and whether we can develop some sort of low-cost, easily deployable, um, very crude instrumentation that can at least flag volcanoes that are becoming seismically active so that we can go out then and, and deploy networks on those volcanoes. 
Um, there are several groups out there that are working on these types of instruments. I know Pascal has um, some interest in this type of um, this type of innovation um, and is, is working on uh, problems like this. Um, so these are possible approaches, but again, the key is that we when we try to think about these big questions, we have to really um, revise our, our time scale um, to, to, to be able to, to appropriately answer questions like this um, from a seismological standpoint. Okay. Um, so the third challenge I want to bring up, and this, this uh, segues into part two of this talk, um, is it's kind of a research and a monitoring challenge. Um, so obviously volcanoes are um, uh, certainly a, a natural hazard and, and therefore require, um, if possible, some sort of monitoring and forecasting. Um, the types of questions that need to be answered regarding a potentially active volcano are, is it likely to erupt? Um, when is that eruption going to occur? How, how big will that eruption be? What style of eruption? But also, how long is the eruption going to last um, is the eruption over or is it just paused? Um, we tend to focus on the is the eruption going to happen, is it likely, and also when is it going to happen. Um, but I just want to point out at this point that, that there are a spectrum of monitoring questions that, that are very intimately linked to research in volcano seismology um, that, that lead us to, to do a lot of work to look for um, characteristics that we can use to try to answer these questions in real time in crisis situations. So can we see in the seismic data that we collect a signature of the beginning of an eruption or the end of an eruption as opposed to a pause? Um, so basically, can we identify whether the volcano is actually going from uh, quiescence uh, to active and just passing through this sort of intermediate restless state, or whether it's just taking a temporary departure, maybe becoming restless, but then quieting back down? So what I'm going to do in the next um, 20 minutes is basically go through four case studies um, that I and my students have, have worked on, um, showing you examples of, of each one of the possible um, scenarios um, for a volcano that's restless. So I'll show you an example um, of a volcano that's in eruption that goes into a temporary uh, sort of restless phase and then back into an eruption. I'll show you a volcano that goes through a restless phase and uh, into quiescence, and then I'll show you the two opposite ones, volcano that goes from quiescence into restlessness and back, basically a false alarm, and then a volcano that actually goes through this phase in a very bizarre, sort of different than we're used to seeing way, but proceeds on to a minor eruption. And so the point, the takeaway point from this talk, the one thing I really want to get across is that in general, these four different scenarios are actually going to look quite similar from a seismological standpoint. So it's, it's a challenge, basically, to answer these questions. And if you take one thing away from this talk, um, that's what I hope you'll take away. Um, but also that if we really mine into the data um, and also take a holistic approach in interpreting the seismic data in the context of other data streams we might have available, um, that there is hope, um, and, and certainly more and more uh, case studies and, and building up our understanding of the different possibilities is, is the way forward. Okay, so moving on to uh, the first case study, and, and in each of these, I've, I've put these little codes up here in the corner of the screen, um, basically showing you which scenario I'm talking about. So this is going to be a scenario where the volcano goes from active uh, to restless, um, but not erupting, and then back to active. Um, so this is um, a fairly long-term eruption, Super Air Hills uh, in Montserrat. The eruption started in 1995, um, and it's still um, considered to be a, an ongoing eruption. It's, it's, it's been paused recently. Um, but um, the interesting thing about this eruption is that it's, it, it hasn't been continuously erupting since 1995. It's gone through these uh, different phases separated by periods of, of quiescence, of no eruption, um, that can last uh, quite a long time, up to a year and a half, um, and sometimes shorter. So um, you see that now there have been five phases of eruption uh, separated by these pauses. And I'm going to focus in on this first pause here. Um, so the issue here is that uh, this is a very devastating eruption. Um, this eruption basically devastated the, uh, the economy and um, much of the, the population of Montserrat. It buried and required um, 
permanent evacuation of um, the capital city on the south end of the island, it's caused a lot of havoc. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's an ongoing eruption. It's a long-term eruption. So um, it's been very difficult for the, the residents of Montserrat uh, to uh, make a plan for how to essentially recover from this and, and uh, continue on. Um, so, of course, every time the volcano goes into a pause phase, and particularly during this first pause here, where it wasn't clear that this was going to be an episodic eruption, the question asked very rightly was, well, is, is the eruption over? Can we, can we go back to our daily lives? Are we done with this? Um, Unfortunately, during this first pause, it was ambiguous. Um, the seismicity, which you're seeing up on the top, so this is just total events per day, um, dropped substantially. In fact, this period was referred to as the seismic gap. Um, you can probably see why its seismicity just dropped way off. But other signals of uh, volcanic activity remained high. Um, so the GPS data, the deformation data, suggested continued inflation, at least through the latter half of this period. And the SO2 values were also high. So unfortunately, it was a very difficult question to answer and a very frustrating question, frustrating situation for everybody involved. Um, so I mentioned that this, this period was referred to as the seismic gap. That threw me a little bit when I first uh, started working on Montserrat in uh, 2004. Um, I didn't understand why it was the seismic gap because I was looking at um, a subset of, of the seismic catalog. I was looking only at the VT earthquakes as opposed to the full catalog. And you get a very different picture of what was going on, the level of activity seismically, depending on whether you look at everything, LPs and VTs included, or just the VTs. So while the LPs during this period dropped off very sharply uh, for VT activity, so the, these are the rock-breaking high-frequency earthquakes, um, they, the observatory recorded actually some of the highest levels of, of VT seismicity during the entire eruption during this period. Um, so this is a very strong VT phase. Um, this is just a, a blow up of that period, so showing you on the bottom here the, the rate of VT earthquakes, so number of events per day, very high. Uh, compared to the rate of uh, LP events, low frequency events, which were very low, except for uh, immediately before the eruption restarted in November of 1999. There was a very short duration swarm uh, of LP earthquakes that, that preceded the uh, renewal of the eruption and the start of phase two of the eruption. So actually not, not unlike what you'd expect from the generic uh, volcanic earthquake model. However, um, it's important then to go back and understand, well, what was generating all of these VTs? Why, why were they, why were they remaining high, uh, why were they actually higher during this period than during other periods. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, I worked on during my postdoc um, was looking at fault plane solutions um, through the entire eruption, but, but um, with a particular interest in this period um, to, to see if there was anything that we could, we could find in hindsight um, that would tell us about what was going on, um, why was the seismicity high, and what processes were driving that seismicity during that eruption pause. So I'm going to um, step back for a second and just do a brief primer on fault plane solutions here, because you'll you'll see them a few times during the talk. Um, so this is the the 25 cent guide. Um, basically, a fault plane solution uh, gives you information on uh, the two potential fault planes, the, the nodal planes that could have slipped during the earthquake, so what their strike, dip, and rake were. And then from, from those, uh, we can actually uh, make a simple inference about where the uh, maximum compressive stresses and minimum compressive stresses were that drove that, that earthquake event. Um, so in this case, the p-axis would tell us that this is the uh, direction of maximum compression to produce slip on either one of these faults with the sense of slip that was observed, whereas this would be the orientation of minimum compression. You're not actually going to see the fault plane solutions. You're going to see these rose diagrams throughout the talk, which are just summaries of, um, they're essentially circular histograms showing you the orientation of uh, p-axis azimuths. So um, these are going to represent groups of fault plane solutions. And then this arrow that you'll see outside the rose diagram just tells you where we think the uh, the regional um, maximum compressive stress axis 
uh, is oriented. So we're looking to see if there are any deviations from that during volcanic activity in the volcanic fault plane solutions. So over on the right side of the screen here, again, I've got the, the VTs um, per day during this period of intereruptive uh, quiescence. You can see that there isn't a whole lot of difference in the, the rate. Um, if anything, it, it sort of goes down through this period. Uh, there is this one fairly strong swarm, um, but in general, it's not, a, it's not a steadily increasing rate of seismicity up to the eruption. So that wasn't something that that, that changed in a, in a consistent manner that, that sort of led up to the eruption. But one of the changes that we did identify through the fault plane solution analysis was that about uh, two-thirds of the way through this period, um, in May of 99, um, we started to see these uh, fault plane solutions with um, p-axes that were very different from uh, the regional sense of faulting and, and the sense of faulting during the earlier part of this period. So from uh, the beginning of this pause, uh, for about one year, we saw earthquakes that essentially reflected a, a sort of regional stress field, um, a tectonic stress field, um, and then these guys started to show up a few months before eruption, and they essentially remained constant um, up until the eruption restart. So this was an interesting change that occurred through this period. Um, and this is how we interpret it. Um, you'll see this again a few times through the talk, so I'm going to spend a moment here explaining this uh, interpretation. Um, so in general, um, there is a really simple geometric relationship between the, the orientation of a dike and uh, the direction of its inflation. So dikes always want to inflate in the direction of least resistance which is the, minim the orientation of the minimum compressive stress axis. So um, a dike will orient itself parallel to regional or background maximum compression and will inflate perpendicular to that. So the, the orientation of the, the background stress field basically con controls the orientation of the dike and the direction of its inflation. So what we theorize is that when we see these rotations, these uh, um, anomalous fault plane solutions, that's a signature of, the, uh, of a dike-like conduit that's starting to inflate. So applying that to the, the Montserrat data, we could potentially interpret that period and the change in fault plane solutions as first uh, perhaps a period of relaxation. Um, the first phase of the eruption had emptied out um, the conduit. The rock around the conduit was relaxing as the conduit collapsed and we saw seismicity that was basically reflect, reflecting that relaxation um, as opposed to an inflationing, inflating dike. And then the switchover occurred about six months where we started to see the signature of inflation and then the eruption began. So putting that in the context of other observations that are available, um, so the switch in fault plane solution orientation occurred right around here. Um, and if you look at the GPS data and the SO2 data, um, we can explain all of the observations more or less in the context of a, a, a essentially a, a dike that was beginning to inflate but that perhaps was, was plugged and was building up pressure. So you can actually see in the GPS data that there's a, a possible suggestion of a, a deflation through here and then an inflection point at about the same time that we saw this rotation. Um, then the dike began to inflate. Um, SO2 actually dropped to the period, so whatever gas was in whether there was gas in the conduit or not, if there was, it wasn't coming out. And this may have been a signature of a conduit that was plugged and therefore inflating. So this, this appears to be a reasonable scenario for what was going on during this period. OK, so moving on to the next example. Um, and, and what I hope you'll see is how similar um, this, the seismicity is between the Super Air Hills example and this example. Um, this is a case where um, what I'm going to show you is a volcano that's essentially moving into quiescence. So this is the end of an eruption, uh, going from an active, actively erupting phase through a restless phase to quiescence. Uh, no, more, no more stuff coming out the top. So this is the 1992 eruption of Crater Peak, uh, which is a vent of Mount Spur in Alaska in the eastern Aleutians. Um, this is an overview of the seismicity for the eruption. Again, this is sort of everything lumped together, um, but it gives you a good sense of the progression of the eruption. Um, so uh, prior to the eruption, which began in June of 1992, there were about nine months of gradually increasing seismicity. Most of it was VT seismicity, so again, kind of nicely following the generic swarm model. Um, 
The June eruption uh, was preceded by some tremor, um, so very short-term warning, again consistent with the model. Um, interestingly, following that first eruption, the volcano became almost nearly aseismic, and um, there was another eruption right in the middle of this period, but uh, it was neither preceded nor accompanied by uh, really any seismicity whatsoever, which was quite strange. Um, then there was a third eruption, again, uh, short-term tremor, um, uh, VT seismicity accompanying that. Um, then following the eruption, there was a period of about six weeks where things basically got very quiet. And then in uh, November, in the fall of that year, so this is three eruptions, one, two, three, these three arrows. In November, there was a very strong swarm of earthquakes, mostly VTs, but also some tremor as well. And of course, this raised the question, well, was this a fourth eruption of this volcano? Um, again, following the, the first few eruptions, things had gotten quiet, and then there was another eruption. So perhaps this was just number four in the sequence. Um, in this case, however, um, there was no eruption here. There was another smaller swarm in December. Again, no eruption. So this was basically just the process of the volcano finishing out its eruption sequence, but, but not being able to transmit magma to the surface anymore. Okay, so um, a little more detail on this November swarm, which is right here. Um, uh, it was, again, primarily VT seismicity, but accompanied by some uh, tremor and low frequency seismicity. Um, it uh, was fairly shallow um, and uh, was also accompanied by some deeper seismicity that was actually not present at the beginning of the eruption. And this is more detail than I can go into. This is an absolutely fascinating story. Um, but the upshot here is that, again, when we look at the fault plane solutions uh, through the eruption and the, the post-eruptive uh, seismic unrest, we see something that's very similar to, to what was observed during that inter-eruptive pause at Soufrier Hills, which is that um, prior to the eruption, uh, so beginning with that uh, increase in VT seismicity and going for about nine months, uh, we saw rotated fault plane solutions, again, suggesting that uh, a conduit was pressurizing and, and perhaps inflating. Uh, immediately following the eruption, again, very much like the first half of that inter-eruptive period at Soufrier Hills, um, things got both quiet seismically, but also the fault plane solutions were uh, not reflecting any sort of uh, dike inflation. And then beginning with that uh, sharp swarm, we again saw this uh, rotated signature in the fault plane solutions, su suggesting that this was a dike that was pressurizing and inflating. Um, so for all intents and purposes, based on the seismicity, um, these two were very similar, um, except that in one case the volcano did go back into eruption, and in the other case uh, this was the end of the eruption and, and, and not a renewed phase of, of eruptive activity. So it's quite interesting that, that you know, such different scenarios can, can result in, um, at least to a first order, very similar characteristics in the seismicity. Okay, uh, moving on to the next two examples, um, and then I'll just br briefly wrap up and we can move on to the questions. Um, the first one I want to talk about, so now I'm going to talk about volcanoes going from quiescence towards restlessness. And the first one I'm going to talk about um, is a, a very quick little episode that occurred in 2006 at a volcano in the Katmai group in Alaska, again in the eastern Aleutians. This was a case where the volcano went from relative quiescence to um, a, an, a restless state and then back to quiescence. Um, of course, you know, this pr presents interesting challenges for, for monitoring because we want to know, well, is this going to then proceed on to eruption or not? So it's very interesting to go back and look at these in hindsight and, and see what they look like. Um, so again, here's a very simple histogram diagram showing, showing you the, the number of earthquakes, in this case it's per month, um, over the, the decade preceding this very strong swarm in January of 2006. Uh, the swarm itself, so this is just a monthly plot, but the swarm itself actually happened over about a week, um, and then things very rapidly dropped back down to basically what was occurring before the swarm, so it was kind of very quick and then done, and then there were some smaller swarms later on. Um, but our focus was ma mainly on this, this um, large swarm here. I also want to point out, while I've got this uh, slide up, uh, the non-zero level of background activity here. Um, and this is, this is a, something that's been recognized in the Katmai group. Um, it is a, a somewhat swarmy or quakey volcano. Its background is non-zero. Um, but um, 
when when there is a departure, it's quite obvious. Um, so this is this is uh, sort of nice, but it's it's not zero when it's when it's in its what we would consider a quiescent phase. Okay, so um, again, here's the same uh, data set just shown as a time depth plot with some magnitude information. Um, again, you can see the the non-zero swarm the non-zero background activity punctuated by the swarm in January. Um, and the main point I want to make with this slide is just that all of this seismicity, including the swarm, is relatively shallow. Um, so it's about um, three kilometers uh, below sea level and above. Um, so it's a fairly shallow swarm, and then the January swarm actually goes um, pretty much up, up to the, the summit of the volcano. So, so quite shallow seismicity. Okay, and again, um, when we deployed our FPS analysis, our fault plane solutions, um, to look at what was going on um, in the earthquakes themselves, we again saw um, this rotation during the swarm um, that seemed to be consistent with our model of dike inflation. So I haven't got it on here, but uh, regional compression is, is uh, northwest in this segment of the Aleutian Arc, so what we're seeing during the swarm is a departure from that. It's not quite 90 degrees, um, but it's a, it's a swing around and a pretty distinct uh, from both the pre-swarm and post-swarm periods. So again, this is this is this um, observation that we have so far related to the inflation of a dike uh, due to the intrusion of new magma. Um, one thing I want to point out um, in the pre-swarm and post-swarm fault plane solutions compared to the swarm fault plane solutions, um, not only are the, the main orientations different, but there's also a lot more heterogeneity in the orientation of the p-axis. So whereas during the swarm they tend to get fairly well organized, and what you're seeing out on the, the edges of the rose diagram are, are essentially um, standard deviations. You see that uh, during uh, quiescent periods at this volcano, um, the, there really isn't a dominant p-axis orientation. The stress field is kind of just mixed up and heterogeneous, whereas it tends to get a little more organized during the swarm. So coming back to this, this, this actually, this example surprised us a little bit because um, this is a very quick swarm. Um, there weren't any other observations that suggested that magma was being intruded um, uh, during the swarm. There was no uh, noticed ice melting or increased thermal activity. Um, we don't have gas or GPS data, but um, it was a little surprising that this may have actually been a shallow dike intrusion. Um, so one possibility is uh, comes to um, basically how you would be able to generate these rotations and how much force can you for example do you need to do it with magma or could you just uh, inject uh, for example some hydrothermal fluid into uh, some cracks um, does it need to involve magma can it involve something very small scale maybe a tiny amount of magma or uh, a, a fluid that's already um, in the groundwater system but that just somehow gets gets concentrated so if we look at models of um, basically how you would flip a stress field over, it all comes down to the relative strength of the background stress field and the induced stress field. And it turns out that in a background stress field where maximum compression and minimum compression are more or less of equal magnitude, any small perturbation is going to push a fault over in that direction. So if you have a situation where sigma 1 and sigma 3 uh, for, due to tectonics or due to whatever background process is influencing the stress field are more or less equal, and there's a slight increase in one, then that's going to cause a change in the sense of faulting. So this is one possibility for what's going on at Martin. Um, there is some evidence that the background stress field is somewhat isotropic here. Um, the background seismicity is not characterized by a very consistent uh, fault plane solution orientation. They tend to be kind of heterogeneous. Um, so this may have been some very small perturbation that because of the relative magnitude of background stresses was able to change over um, the sense of slip on faults, and, and whether that was magma or some other fluid, um, we don't know. But um, this is this is sort of a, a bit of a mystery, um, and again points to um, how great it is to have uh, gas data or deformation data to tell you a little bit more about what's going on during an episode of, of volcano seismic unrest. Okay, the last one, um, and I see the time that I need to to start wrapping up here. Um, is a bit of a change in gears. Um, 
I wanted to introduce uh, this problem because it's, it's actually a fascinating problem and it gets again at this issue of what do we do with uh, volcanoes that on the surface appear quiescent but when we put our instruments on we get a very different picture. So these are the class uh, that we've termed persistently restless volcanoes. John Sticks also referred to them as quiescently active volcanoes in a geology paper in 2007. Basically there are volcanoes that are not erupting but that seem to exist in that intermediate state between quiescence and eruption, quiescence and active. So they're in a, in a very protracted or per perhaps permanent state of unrest. We know of a handful of them at this point. I'd love to hear more examples if you're aware of them. Um, Shishaldin Volcano in Alaska, for example, and down here I'm showing you, this is um, work from Tanya Peterson's dissertation uh, at University of Alaska, um, showing you uh, what's going on. Um, basically at Shishaldin there are an incredibly surprising number of these long period events. And now if you think back to the, the generic model, long period seismicity is, is normally considered a short term precursor to eruption. But here's a volcano that's able to produce hundreds of long period events a day um, while not erupting and, and that's basically what we see at these other volcanoes as well that these seem to be volcanoes that host long period seismicity more or less continuously. Um, so here you're just seeing a random helicorder plot from Shishaldin. This is 12 hours showing you um, just how frequent these little pops of long period seismicity are. So there are two questions that these oddballs bring up. Um, of course first well if if um, they're already having long period seismicity, then what would we see before an eruption? Um, these volcanoes do occasionally erupt. Sheldon had a major eruption in 99. Um, Talika, the volcano I'm going to talk about next, has occasionally explosive eruptions, sometimes strong eruptions. Um, so there's a monitoring challenge to these. Because this generic model doesn't, doesn't quite fit, we need something else that we can look at. And of course the other question is, well, what on earth is doing this? Um, are these volcanoes that are underlying by convecting magma columns? Um, is this hydrothermal circulation? Is there something else going on? Um, and these are a relatively understudied class of volcanoes from a seismological perspective, so we're just beginning to, to look at some of these questions. But I wanted to end on um, a study that my PhD student Mel Rogers has been doing at Talika Volcano in Nicaragua, which is one of these persistently restless volcanoes. Um, we put a six station broadband uh, seismic network out in 2010 funded by the NSF along with a GPS network um, that uh, Pete Lefemina and one of his PhD students uh, is running, um, basically with the initial aim of trying to look at the background seismicity. But we got very lucky um, and we're able to capture a small uh, eruption in 2011. So this gave us the opportunity to see if we could actually find any uh, precursors to eruption, uh, despite the fact that we couldn't apply this idea of, well, long period earthquakes are a short term precursor to eruption at volcanoes. And in fact, um, what Mel found was, was quite fascinating. So here I'm just showing you um, sort of background seismicity at Talika, again, um, this is just a, a background period um, sometime in early 2010, I believe. Again, showing you the rate of events here and also the fact that they're long period events. So again, what we would normally associate with short-term uh, short activity before an eruption. So what Mel found uh, was that there was a change, but the change was actually opposite of, of the, the sort of generic traditional model. Um, what we saw was an increase in high frequency events. Um, so an increase in what appeared to be classic VT earthquakes. Um, starting, uh, starting about nine months before the eruption, we saw this very sharp increase in high frequency events and the high frequency events remained high uh, through the eruption, uh, which sort of happens over this period. We also at the same time saw a very sharp drop off in the rate of long period seismicity. So typically we see um, anywhere between 300 and 600 LPs per day, um, but uh, Coincident with the onset of the high frequency events, um, there was a very clear and sharp drop off in the LPs that basically lasted until the volcano erupted and then it's been fluctuating, uh, I think up to the present or at last the last data I've seen. So this is potentially a nice precursor, um, but it doesn't fit with our, our model. And um, so what we're basically uh, theorizing here is that, that what's happened at this volcano is that um, it, uh, went through a state where it was openly degassing, releasing pressure, generating LPs in the process, but then somehow got sealed up, um, started to pressurize, started to break rock, break new pathways for the gas, 
um, and that resulted in this small series of explosions in 2011. Um, then once gas pathways were reestablished, we could start to see the LPs again because uh, gas was able to flow through the system. So this is a really interesting uh, example. We don't know a whole lot about it yet, but again, another, another example of, of just how tricky uh, it can be to, to decide which state to assign to a volcano, especially when that volcano is in a restless state, and also to think about what it's going to do next and what clues it will give us to tell us whether it's going to become active or quiescent or whether it's just going to stay restless. Okay, um, so I won't go through these in detail. I'll just uh, leave them up here. Um, basically just some summaries of the, the main points I've, I've tried to present in this talk. Um, I'll come back to this. I just want to acknowledge um, the uh, collaborators on the individual projects that I discussed today. Um, uh, the funding that I've gotten from various agencies, and most importantly, um, a lot of the data that I've shown you came from volcano observatories who very generously shared it. Um, these are resources that I could not have collected myself. Um, these were long-term data sets. Um, not only were the data supplied, but of course very important context um, and collaboration, um, which really makes this type of work possible. So, so those partnerships are, are invaluable to me, and uh, I certainly want to um, end by, by emphasizing how important uh, those sorts of research observatory partnerships are to the field of volcano seismology. Um, I'll end on that note and uh, just keep these up, and I'm happy to answer any questions or give any more details. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Diana. Um, so I have a few questions in the window. If anybody, if you have questions, uh, please type them in. And uh, like I said earlier, just try to make them clear and concise so I'm able to, uh, you know, read them correctly when I'm uh, delivering them to Diana. And uh, like I said, there's three. So I will just start uh, from the top with what were submitted during the talk. And um, the first question is from Ben Edwards, and Ben asks, why do signals from explosions uh, last longer than LPs? That's a good question. Um, basically because, well, it depends on the, the length of the explosion. Um, so a volcanic explosion usually takes minutes to occur and as that explosion is occurring basically what we see on a seismometer is, is pretty much anything that can produce vibrations in the ground. Um, so uh, the, the, the seismic signals you get during things like explosions, rock falls and so on, they're very messy um, and they're combined, they're basically the combination of everything that's going on that's coupling energy back into the ground. Rock falls, um, material that's exiting through perhaps a, a a constricted vent um, and, and essentially pushing out on the walls of the, the vent, um, stuff that's raining back onto the ground. So, so basically the duration of the seismic signal is more or less the duration of the explosion. As to why LPs are um, much shorter, again this, this gets to the, the source process and um, one of the, the debates about LPs is um, and, is tremor basically just a continuous LP process? Um, so is, is tremor, which is a continuous signal that can last um, anywhere from uh, tens of seconds to um, hours or days, is that just a very long, long run LP process? So um, I guess the example I gave doesn't necessarily, it's, it's a bit misleading in that sense. Um, a typical LP is short, um, but if you consider tremor to be a series of LPs that are more or less continuous, um, that's a much longer s signal and maybe even longer duration than an explosion signal. All right, thanks. Uh, next question is from Akron uh, Mostafanejad, and Akron asks, uh, do you get the fault plane solution from VT or LP events? If from both, is there any difference between the results? Mm. Um, all of the fault plane solution work I've done has been focused on VTs just because they're, um, we're pretty comfortable assuming that these are shear failure events um, based on the, the shape of the seismogram of the waveform. Um, so we can just apply simple uh, sort of double couple models to them, which is, which is really in most cases what we're limited to um, by the seismic networks. We usually don't have many seismometers. 
Um, they're often short period instruments, um, so we can't do full waveform inversions. We may not have more than one three component instrument. Um, when people look at the um, source mechanism, the, the, the moment tensor for LPs, um, that tends to be a much more involved calculation. Um, people have done it. Um, in particular, Bernard Chouet has done a lot of work on this. Um, again, they're very diff difficult to compare because we think that they're produced by extremely different processes. Um, I haven't tried to look at LPs from a, from a simple um, sort of focal mechanism stress perspective. I don't know that it would be meaningful, um, but I guess the short answer to the question is that, that all of the focal mechanisms are for VT earthquakes. Okay, uh, next question is from Kathy Unglert, and Kathy asks, for your case studies, are there any other indicators for changes in the stress field, uh, e.g. seismic anisotropy? Ah, um, hi Kathy, and uh, yes, actually, thank you for asking. Um, in a few cases, we're, we're lucky enough to, to have the, uh, the network to be able to look at shear wave splitting, which again is a, a, a technique that requires um, slightly more advanced instrumentation and processing, so at minimum you need a three-component seismometer. Um, and on Montserrat, we were able to, uh, myself and Martha Savage, were able to do essentially a comparative study um, of uh, fault plane changes in stress suggested by fault plane solutions and um, picked up in shear wave splitting. And we actually did find a very nice correspondence uh, between, between the two. Um, so that, that was quite um, encouraging uh, to sort of confirm that maybe not necessarily that our model was correct for explaining it, but that there were real changes in stress uh, that were occurring uh, when we thought they were occurring. Um, there are other other cases where where those two comparisons have been done, but um, that's the one that I've been involved in and, and the one where I think we really had uh, had a good data set to make that comparison. Um, and you can look in JGR for that paper. It was out in 2011 um, if you're interested. Okay, uh, next questions are from Melanie Ray. Uh, she submitted two questions, but they're a little related, so I think I'll ask them together. Uh, the first part was, how do eruption types affect the seismicity signatures of volcanoes? And sort of a related question, are the eruption types of magmas consistently different in talika type volcanoes versus those that fit the pre-eruption seismicity model? Oh, that's a fascinating question. I think that's, that's a whole other talk. Um, uh, let's see. Um, the short answer is... Um, we don't really know. Um, so, at least to my knowledge, there isn't an easily generalizable relationship between um, seismicity and eruption type, um, meaning effusive, explosive, um, you know, and degrees of explosivity, um, or magma composition. There are some suggestions um, of, of differences that, that are really intriguing. Um, but right now, you know, if you if you go to um, Kilauea and if you go to um, Mount St. Helens, you'll find very similar things in the seismicity. We see tremor at both. We see BTs at both. Um, they erupt very differently. They erupt very different compositions. So um, I think that's a great question, and and I'm afraid I can't answer it. But um, you know, I think that's 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 really a key going forward to to ask those questions and to try and explore them. Um, the second question was about Talika um, and its eruptions. So um, we don't know a whole lot about the uh, the way Talika erupts. Um, we know that it has in uh, in sort of recent history had actually large eruptions, VEI fours. Um, if you go and you look at it, you see that there are large lava flows um, nearby. These recent eruptions. Um, appeared to be mostly sort of gassy eruptions. Um, uh, the GPS network uh, didn't really see strong deformation. We didn't actually see much juvenile material at all. Um, so that seems to be a typical kind of behavior at Talika, at least, and, and possibly at some of these other ones. Um, but again, we, we need that longer term uh, time series. And, and also, it would be great to see a magmatic eruption at Talika. Um, to see if there's any difference and if, if there is a relationship between this weird type of seismicity we're seeing there and, and the type of eruptions uh, that it has currently. Okay, uh, next question is from Julia McDougall, 
and Julia asks, have you seen any evidence for volcanic triggering of non-volcanic earthquakes in adjacent areas? Oh, that's or, another fascinating. <laughs> sort of the second part of this question is, or are all nearby earthquakes that occur during volcanic activity classified as volcanic? Um, you know, there's, there isn't, this is, this is, uh, it's another good question. So, so normally, um, when we talk about volcanic earthquakes, they, they tend to top out at about a magnitude three. Um, there's been a lot of focus, um, on, uh, triggering of volcanic activity by, um, tectonic earthquakes, um, and, uh, not as much on triggering of large magnitude earthquakes, whether they're tectonic or, or volcanic by volcanic eruptions. But again, there are some, some sort of interesting um, but, but ambiguous uh, cases out there. I mean, certainly there are, there are, are volcanic eruptions that have been associated with large earthquakes. Um, the Mount St. Helens eruption actually started with a, a quite large earthquake, um, which was probably related to the, the catastrophic failure of, of the summit. Um, occasionally, there is a large earthquake. Um, in uh, 2007, there were a pair of magnitude fours um, near Kilauea summit um, that were very unusual in terms of their magnitude. Um, but again, it's, it's a chicken or egg thing. Um, and, and with many of these cases, especially when the earthquake is, is somewhat close to the volcano and the timing between the earthquake and the eruption is, is somewhat close, you know, you can kind of argue it both ways that one triggered the other or, or that maybe they're unrelated. Um, we tend to class uh, small magnitude uh, swarmy earthquakes happening near volcanoes as volcanic. So, so basically a, a volcanic sequence, a swarm, is usually a swarm. It doesn't have a clear main shock. Um, it doesn't far up follow a Mori type decay. Um, it's, it's kind of, you know it when you see it, and, and the definitions aren't very clear. Okay, uh, next question is from Amanda Lowe, and Amanda asks, do any of the quiescently active volcanoes show odd patterns in DLP? We, I don't know. Um, we haven't gone as far as looking um, at Talika for DLPs. Uh, DLPs, for those of you um, out there, are deep, long period events. Um, and again, this is, this is another sort of fascinating, open question out there. Um, we tend to think of LPs as, as shallow phenomena related to um, degassing and fluid circulation, but um, there have been observations actually quite consistently of very deep, um, down to 40 kilometers or so, long period events. They're clearly long period events. They're not filtered out in any weird way. Um, they accompany and follow eruptions. Sometimes they occur in swarms um, not associated with an eruption. Um, I don't know. I hope that that's something as we sift through our, our hundreds of thousands of earthquakes that uh, we'll be able to study. And it's a very good question, but um, I'm afraid I don't know. And I, I also don't know uh, about any of the other examples. Um, I'm not aware of any, but I'm not sure how well um, anybody has looked for them. Okay. Um, next question starts with a comment uh, is from Greg Wadey, and he says, the model for rotated P axes is compelling. Have you considered how magnitude information might help constrain this model? For example, is there a maximum magnitude you would expect for a dike inflation of a given amount? Um, I have considered it. <laughs> um, actually, that's something that, that a colleague and I were talking about this morning, um, coincidentally, and, and the fact that we, we currently don't know a whole lot about what controls earthquake magnitude in, um, certainly in volcanic settings, why does it tend to top out at three? Um, or in tectonic settings, um, why do we get, you know, we sort of look at it as, well, what's the largest magnitude we've seen here? Um, but we don't know a whole lot about physically what's controlling the maximum magnitude. Um, yes, there, there are some, there are some uh, sort of high-level analyses of a few data sets that could be done, and I hope to do them by EOFSE, um, so stay tuned. Um, but I guess... Uh, I've considered it, but I haven't, I haven't uh, really looked into it in detail. Okay, 
Uh, next question is from Martha Savage, and I think you might have spoken a little bit about this. It's related to the anisotropy. Uh, Martha, Martha starts with a comment. She says, your Montserrat work showed changes in anisotropy at the same time as the FPS changes. Um, the question is, have you seen similar concurrent changes at Katmai or other volcanoes? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, at Katmai, we had initially intended to look for them, um, but uh, I, as far as I'm aware, there's there's another student who's, who's looking at those um, uh, with a network that was put out uh, by Stephanie Prejean, um, basically have, had much better coverage. Um, we did look at them at uh, Redoubt in 2009, and, and I think you've seen this manuscript. Um, uh, what we saw at Redoubt was uh, a much earlier change in the shear wave splitting um, than in the fault plane solutions, um, which is somewhat interesting. And, and our basic explanation for what was going on there uh, was uh, that uh, the rate of, of magma uh, ascent and pressurization basically accelerated through the precursory sequence. So um, the shear wave splitting is basically picking up compression of the rock, whether it's seismic or not. Um, so maybe sensitive to very minute amounts of compression early on in that sequence. Um, and then later on in the sequence, um, as, as magma began to pressurize strongly, um, it was able to do so to an extent that, that was breaking rock and producing earthquakes with rotated fault plane solutions. So those, the, the readout and the superior hills studies are the, really the two where I've, I've worked with, um, uh, with both shear wave splitting and um, uh, fault plane solutions. Uh, okay, great. Um, Martha had a follow-up question about Katmai, so I will uh, skip ahead a couple just to keep that paired. Uh, she asked, for Katmai, can you rule out heterogeneous stress fields combined with changing locations, e.g. small region for the swarm, uh, explaining the time variations? Um, no, I can't. Um, and and that's, that's certainly something that, that uh, has to be considered, and I know Martha, you've you have have done a lot more in terms of looking at um, uh, various things that might be uh, controlling the the changes that we see. Um, no, uh, we we documented a change. Um, there isn't an obvious change in the location of the earthquakes. I showed you the the time depth plot there, um, but not the upper central plot. Um, but basically all of the earthquakes we were looking at were more or less in the same place um, at Katmai. There may have been subtle changes, um, but there wasn't a, a large difference in the location of the pre- uh, and post-swarm events compared to the swarm events. The pre- and post-swarm events were a little bit more widely distributed around the volcano, um, whereas the swarm events were more focused under the volcano. Um, but Certainly, you know, if we were to go into into that and look at, at relative relocations, um, we might find that, but we haven't looked for it yet. Okay, uh, next question is from Alicia Felpito, and Alicia asks, is there a clear signature that distinguishes between pre-eruptive and eruptive tremor? And she sort of defines pre-eruptive as uh, magma vesiculation, magma shallow water interaction. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not sure that pre-eruptive tremor is necessarily um, that we have a, a single good model for it. Uh, there was a paper that was published a couple of years ago uh, by uh, Mark Jelinek and Dave Brokovici that, that argued um, a viable model for tremor was essentially the, the sort of wagging of a column of magma cushioned with an, an annulus of foam. Um, so I think that part of the issue is that the, the models aren't really well understood, um, and I'm not aware of any systematic differences in the uh, characteristics of the, the signals themselves between tremor during an eruption uh, and tremor that's before an eruption. I'm not, I'm not a, I tend not to look at tremor that much, so, so that may not be the correct answer, and, and hopefully um, if somebody, somebody knows of a... Um, of a, of a difference, they can chime in in the question field, but um, to, my, to my knowledge, no, I don't think there is a difference. Okay, uh, next question is a little more uh, open-ended and philosophical. Uh, Julia McDougall asks, what are the difficulties in instrumenting an active volcano? 
<laughs> Money. <laughs> um, well, uh, there are several. Um, the seismometers themselves are expensive, um, depending on what type of seismometer. Um, they're also very sensitive instrumentation, so um, they break easily, uh, especially when you put them in a harsh environment. Um, taking a seismometer out to a volcano depends, the ease of that takes depends a lot on which volcano it is and how accessible it is. Some volcanoes you can basically drive up to. Talika, we can pretty much drive almost up to the summit. Uh, whereas other volcanoes uh, you need uh, helicopter, boat support, um, they're very difficult to get to. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier on that um, it's not enough to just put a seismometer on a volcano. You have to deal with getting the data back from the seismometer um, and that either involves setting up uh, some sort of telemetry which can be uh, logistically difficult and or expensive or going back out to retrieve that data periodically. Um, and that works better for short-term experiments than permanent deployments. But again, you know, it comes down to accessibility, um, the cost, uh, and the time. Um, so, so it is quite challenging. Um, and then, of course, volcanoes are very harsh environments, and they tend to beat up seismometers uh, quite, quite badly. Um, you know, they're corrosive environments. Uh, they're often high, so you know, it's, it's frequent that uh, there's a lightning strike that takes out uh, timing antenna. Um, it's it's a, it's a tricky business to get them on on a volcano and to keep them running and and to get that data back. And then of course processing the data um, is is a challenge in and of itself. Going from a continuous data stream to uh, discrete events and also picking out um, more subtle signals like tremor um, is is the challenge as well. Um, and knowing that you've done that. Uh, to, to get most of the data and haven't haven't uh, you know, missed something important, but but also trying to automate it is is quite tricky. Um, so there are a lot of these these sort of frustrating but but you know challenges that are just the reality of it. Okay, uh, next question is from John Sticks, and he asks or. He starts with a comment. He says that the Talika data are amazing. Do you think that this and other similar volcanoes, there are connections made at discrete times between shallow magmatic, between the shallow magmatic hydrothermal system and a deeper crustal reservoir or reservoirs, which may trigger quote unquote activity, open a system, supply magma and gas, etc. Um, well, first off, thank you, John. And, and again, credit really goes to to Mel and Heldor, the students on the project, for um, doing doing all that work and, and doing such an amazing job with the data. Um, we don't know, and, and that's something that actually we're we're hoping to to find out at Talika. But again, I think I think if that's occurring, um, obviously it's it's not something that's occurred on the scale of our our uh, our work on Talika, and perhaps. Um, this is a system that's recharged maybe every every few decades or so, and if we watch it long enough, we may be able to see that it perhaps receives periodic inputs. Um, maybe that's not the case, but again, you know, having a longer-term uh, data set, I think, would allow us to address that question. And uh, I mean, that's a very it's a very uh, I think it's it's a reasonable hypothesis um, that potentially these volcanoes are getting recharged periodically, but on what time scale and again, what does that look like um, in the geophysical data and, and is it linked with a different type of eruption? We don't know. Um, uh, we're certainly hoping to find out. Okay, uh, down to the last few questions uh, from John West. He asks, is there any relationship between number of LPs and the depth and size of the volcano's magma chamber? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Um, and again, typically LPs show up either as shallow events or as uh, DLPs, as one of the earlier uh, questioners pointed out. Um, so it doesn't seem that they're actually directly related to uh, to a magma chamber, um, at least in sort of the, the classic uh, like balloon and soda straw with the balloon sitting a few kilometers down model. I mean, there may be shallow magma reservoirs, um, shallow chambers that, that host some of that LP activity or allow it to happen. Um, I know that uh, many of the, the models for LP activity at Kilauea 
uh, invoke processes in a very shallow chamber. Um, so they are certainly, but I don't think that there's a, um, a, a sort of generalizable relationship between the number and the, the size or the location of that chamber. Um, the DLPs are a really interesting question. Um, again, because they're so deep, they're a little harder to study, um, and we're, we're sort of you know, the community is, is kind of cataloging them and, and, and trying to link the, the, their occurrence roughly um, to magmatic activity. Um, but again, I, I don't think there's enough information to say. And I, I'm sorry, I feel like everybody, these are great questions, and I feel like I keep saying I don't know. Um, but um, I'm encouraged to hear these questions because I think these are the, these are the tough questions that um, need to be asked and that, that we should be trying to answer and, and push our data to, uh, you know, to help us with. All right, uh, next question is from Christian Farias, and Christian asks, what do you think on the role of a pre-existing fault near a volcano and its dynamics in terms of seismicity, eruption probabilities, et cetera? Um, yeah, the relationship between faults and volcanoes is, is complicated. Um, I mean, I guess I guess what you're asking about is a is a large scale sort of tectonic scale fault. Um, I I think that a lot of the earthquakes that we see during um, during these episodes of seismic unrest are are possibly occurring on pre-existing faults. Um, however, one one interesting um, maybe possible answer to that question has to do with what are called uh, distal VT swarms. Um, so occasionally, we see. Uh, sort of coincident with the onset of an eruption, we see a swarm of what look like VTs, but they're detached from the main cluster uh, that's usually centered on um, and beneath the vent um, and separated from it, but, but seem to be linked to uh, whatever activity is going on. And one possible explanation for those is that maybe that's a fault uh, that's, that's receiving stress from whatever's occurring beneath the volcano and responding to it. Um, it's a little hard to study those events because they tend to be outside um, volcano seismic networks, which are usually centered on the vent itself. So there's this sort of intriguing thing that's out at the um, the, the edges of, of what we would sort of draw our circle around the volcano and say that's volcanic seismicity. This comes to the earlier question. Um, Randy White uh, of the USGS has, has done um, an incredible amount of work um, sort of thinking about and, and describing these distal VT swarms and, and, you know, certainly has lots of ideas about what, uh, what might cause them. Um, I'm not aware of any that are clearly linked to a known fault, um, but, uh, you know, it's possible that there are faulted areas that are um, maybe not easily visible or mapped on the surface that are, that are one possible explanation for why we occasionally get distal VT swarms. Okay, great. Uh, next question is from Sigurlog Heltadottir, and uh, Sigurlog asks, you present an interesting pattern of p-axis orientations during different phases. Have you observed different patterns in FPS through depth? Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, we haven't. Um, which is actually interesting in and of itself. Um, and I, I have systematically gone through several of the data sets and, and looked for those changes in depth. Um, they don't seem to be there, at least in any of the data sets that we've, uh, me and my group have, have worked on. Um, one possibility, however, and, and this is a little bit of the, the sort of dirty secret side of it, is that we're often somewhat depth restricted in um, which events we can calculate good fault plane solutions for. So we, it's quite possible that we may be missing those changes and they exist just because um, the, the nature of the seismic network only allows us to get good fault plane solutions, good focal sphere coverage for a certain depth range. Um, in other cases, um, there's a surprising lack of, of depth range in the earthquakes themselves. So for example, beneath superior hills, um, more or less, all of, almost all of the VTs to date have been in a very, very narrow um, depth range. And within error, they're basically coming from the same depth. Um, so there aren't, there aren't always data sets that have a range in, in earthquake depth. Um, but uh, 
we might be limited in, in being able to visualize uh, any depth dependent changes in the fault plane solutions if they're there. Okay, a uh, couple more questions trickled in. Uh, one is from Henry Odbert, and he asks, is there evidence or an expectation for how the character of background VT seismicity changes from the quiescence before and after an eruption? Um, well, certainly there are, there are some, some broad changes that, that I mentioned in the talk. Um, obviously, the rate of them uh, tends to go up um, more often than not. In fact, um, generally, uh, there's a swarm or several swarms or uh, an increasing rate of VT seismicity that leads up to an eruption. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of work looking at those rates um, to, to try and see if um, using, uses, using essentially um, sort of failure theory uh, to see if, if information can be taken out of those rates to try and predict the timing of eruption. Um, so that's one change. Um, we've seen this, this rotation in fault plane solutions before eruptions in many cases, but what's interesting is that we've also found it in cases where the volcano didn't erupt, so the Martin example. Um, so uh, it's sort of interesting, and again, the Martin example was a case where we had a very sudden uh, strong increase in seismicity. Um, there are occasionally swarms that precede eruptions that uh, shallow in depth through time. Um, there are a few very nice examples of this at Piton de la Fournaise in 1998. There was a paper by Jean Battaglia uh, a few years ago that, that documented a really beautiful um, upward migration of VT hypocenters um, prior to an eruption at Piton de la Fournaise. Um, but again, that's something that, that is not always observed. Um, so in general, there, there are changes, but there isn't any sort of one, one size fits all magic bullet. Um, in general, I think the intensification of seismicity, um, you know, clues from uh, the seismicity itself, but also in the context of uh, what else is going on in terms of gas emissions, um, observations of the volcano itself. Um, there are things that usually change before an eruption, um, but there isn't, there isn't always a simple, uh, you know, clear, clear sign. Okay, a uh, question from Waldo Taylor. Can the seismic swarms be located around the volcano close to the magma chamber limits before an eruption? Uh, yes, actually the seismic swarms uh, that, that I've been talking about tend to be very close to the volcano. Um, so I mentioned distal VT swarms, but um, most commonly uh, earthquakes, small micro seismic earthquakes, so VTs and LPs, are centered more or less beneath the volcano um, and, and in a fairly tight cluster beneath the volcano. Um, so usually when we see pre-eruptive seismicity, um, it is actually very close to uh, where the eruption occurs or, or where we think magma is moving up in the system. Okay, great. And uh, so last question is from Melanie Ray, and it's a little more philosophical. Uh, Melanie wants to know, what are you going to do next? <laughs> Uh, tonight, I'm going to go home and <laughs> uh, take it easy this evening. Um, what am I going to do next? Well, um, I've, I've recently moved to Carnegie, which is a really neat place, um, and so I've, I'm spinning up all sorts of new projects. Um, uh, obviously, we have a lot of ongoing studies. The Talika project is ongoing. Um, I'm, I'm still working on various data sets in Alaska. Um, one, one thing that I'm, I'm excited about, we're, we're actually starting to try to tackle this instrument um, development problem um, and to think about, well, are there ways that we could maybe get around uh, this issue of, you know, it's just difficult and expensive to instrument every single volcano. So um, can we design a, a, a kind of a crude, um, you know, good enough instrument that will at least tell us, you know, here's a place that you might want to put some seismometers. And that's a very project in the very early stages, but um, it's one that I'm, I'm actually very, very excited about. And uh, it's a risky project, um, but um, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we stepped back and said, well, what's, what's one of the, the big, uh, big limitations of, of moving forward in volcano seismology? And, and this, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this, this issue of, of not being able to, to look at data sets from for example, the, the years before the Chaitan eruption is, is very frustrating. And, and so 
strategies for, for dealing with that and for trying to recover those sorts of data sets um, is, is one of the things I'm focusing on um, in, in the near future and that I'm really excited about. Great. Well, um, that concludes the webinar. Uh, no more questions in the window. And uh, Diane, I have to compliment you because this was the first webinar that actually hit our limit of 100 people in the room. So uh, I think a few people at least will be taking advantage of the YouTube viewing option of this afterwards. And now I have the excuse to upgrade our account. So uh, thank you very much. This was a great. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, this is great. There are lots of great questions. And uh, as a structural seismologist, I learned a lot about volcanoes today, which was nice. Oh, thank you. And, and thanks, everybody, for, for uh, listening in and for all the great questions. That was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise, everybody. Uh, and uh, for the 71 of you who are still out there, if any of you have been watching as a group, uh, just send me an email or a note letting me how many people, uh, in addition to you, were in the room. I know that a few people do these group viewings, and it's always nice to hear, uh, you know, try to get more of a count than just the 100 who are in the room. Uh, but anyway, well, Diana, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to everyone else out there. And uh, we will see you at the next webinar. And uh, again, look for this online in a day or two.